Okay, so we are live and um, thank you very much everybody who's joining us this evening. My name is Maya Binkin and I am the Artistic Director of Newlands House Gallery. Um, you can see in my background over here, I've got our current exhibition, From Life, uh, featuring the works of Lillian Tomasco and Sean Scully. And it's on until the 10th of October. And I very much hope that um, whoever hasn't had the opportunity yet to see the exhibition will do so in the very near future. Um, we're here this evening as part of our Descendants series, and we're talking this evening with Mary Moore. Um, Henry Spencer Moore was born in 19, sorry, in 1898 in Castleford in a small town, uh, a small mining town in Yorkshire, and was undoubtedly one of the most important British artists of the 20th century, and arguably the most internationally celebrated sculptor of the period. He is renowned for creating semi-abstract forms which were both modern and surreal simultaneously. His monumental bronzes, instantly recognizable, can be seen all over the world. He first trained to be the teacher, to be a teacher, and after serving in the British Army, he continued to study at the Leeds School of Art and the RCA in London. Though he's primarily celebrated for his sculpture, he also produced many drawings, including a series depicting Londoners during the Blitz, which is famed for have captured the mood of the time. Moore became a celebrity in his lifetime, enjoying both fame and financial success. Though he lived frugally and endowed most of his money that he earned to the Henry Moore Foundation, which continues to promote art and support education to today. Henry Moore died in 1986. We are here this evening speaking with his daughter, Mary Moore, who, along with her parents, helped to set up the Henry Moore Foundation, which was the first of its kind. Together, they established the structure that would model all future foundations around the world. Mary has worked in numerous exhibitions on, um, of her father's work and has contributed to the catalogue resume. She continues to represent the family, both in the UK and abroad. With thanks to Mary, one can now visit Henry Moore's home, Hoglands, which she opened to the public. She is a board member of DAX and has been the patron of various charitable organizations, including Tate, Outset, Art Angel, the New Museum in New York, and the Hayward Gallery in London, in London to name but a few. I am able to share with our audiences this evening some really fantastic images of Henry Moore and of Mary and Henry at work with thanks to Mary and the Henry Moore Foundation. So I just wanted to firstly say thank you very, very much to the Henry Moore Foundation for sharing some extraordinary images with us, um, which I'll pop up onto the screen in just a moment. Um, and of course, Mary, thank you very, very much for your time this evening. Um, and um, just just again on the photos, um, when, when I received them and I started looking through the photos, I couldn't help but be struck at how very tender they are and, and how um, caring um, the, the, the relationship seems to come across between yourself and your father. And I, I just really wanted to, to start off by asking, what was Henry Moore like as a father? We all know him as a sculptor, of course. Oh, um... I was born when my father was 50. So, um, I was an only child and, and born late. So I guess I was very much um, loved and um, spoiled. You could even go so far as to say that I was spoiled. Um, but I think anybody who has um, an artist or a writer or maybe a musician, uh, a father who works who doesn't go out to work, who doesn't go to a nine to five job, uh, perhaps in a, take a train and go to the city. I mean, uh, a father or mother who works at home and whose whole life work sort of takes place at home, within the home and within the space of the home. I think um, I was really privileged to enjoy that. Um, and I hope that some of the photographs um, give that sort of sense. So. I had a very unusual and privileged and kind of extraordinary, extraordinary childhood, which of course I thought was normal. And tell me, well, 
I mean, we'll, we'll, fit, I, I, we'll flip through some of the um, images as we go along so, so our audience will be able to see some of these wonderful, um, very, very tender images with yourself and your father. And here, here you are um, working away with him in, in the studio. Um, but was there, was there a, a moment, seeing as you, you were born into uh, life where, where people admired your father and they, they, it must have seemed very normal to you that people know who he is when you walk in the room. But was there a moment where you sort of realized, hang on a minute, my dad is not like my friend's dad. He's actually famous. This is, this is a famous person that's my father. Um, I mean, I don't think he was really famous till the 60s. Um, this picture, we're looking at a picture now of uh, me sort of working beside him in a studio. This, um, every sort of moment of our life was recorded in a way. I mean, I think my father was very aware of publicity. He not only took photographs of his own sculpture, um, which he did every weekend, you know, and, and used them in the books he was producing um, or... Um, in, you know, in exhibitions and so forth. But he was very aware of, of publicity and um, he, he documented everything he did. I think there was a tremendous awareness in my father of the power of, 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 of a visual image and the power of communication. After all, before or while he was growing up, I mean, after he'd served he was in the trenches in the First World War when he was 19 and he was gassed out. But then he came back and was a teacher uh, in Yorkshire. He was a great teacher. And um, he, I mean, one of the extraordinary abilities he had was in being able to explain. Um, he, he explained sculpture. I mean, I think one of his crusading things was to help people enjoy sculpture because People quite naturally enjoy a two-dimensional image. They're very used to looking, uh, particularly now, at screens and two-dimensional images in photography. But the th uh, three-dimensional art is a completely different thing. It's a, um, and he spent a tremendous amount of time explaining to both the people who came to buy sculpture or look at sculpture or students who, who came by, um, I, um, you know, how to understand or how to enjoy and appreciate three-dimensional art. So we also had a very public life. I mean, I don't think that there were really very many private moments. Um, mm -hmm. And is that something that you found particularly challenging? I mean, or it, it, is that something that maybe you, 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 you missed as a child, that now looking back at it, sort of that, that you wanted to have maybe a few more um, sort of more uh, um, private moments with, with, with your father? No, no, it was completely normal. But for instance, you know, uh, he had uh, an assistant working for him or maybe two assistants working for him. Um, we always had people in the house, um, you know, the, studio, uh, the, pe the assistants working in the studio came and had elevenses in the house every day mm -hmm. around a table. And those were people like Philip King or Tony Cairo or other assistants. We've from... actually got a lovely photo over here of um, your father working in the studio oh, so um, with yes. Anthony Cairo. So, I mean, in a weird way, um, everything that happened in my home seemed normal, but uh, he decided to, to experiment with having a bronze fountain. So in the 50s, I think in, a, in, a, in, the, in the vegetable garden, they, um, they got a huge bellows and they managed to make a furnace. And um, I think these pictures are of three assistants, probably Tony Cairo, mm -hmm. Olive Richmond. I think there was another... Um, Alan Ingham. Ang Alan Ingham, who came from Australia, and they were sort of there. And they, they cast, um, I think we've got a picture of the cast. Um, Here it is, it, yep. Mother and Child. Um, and it came out, you can see, I mean, it was very unfinished and it's got, it's a very vicious mother and child and it's got a kind of hacksaw head and the hacksaw head was um, accentuated really by the way that the rough um, bronze was not cleaned off the final, off the final image. So it's very rough, but, but what I'm saying is 
in a way, I grew up with many practical, extraordinary practical things happening around me, like bronze foundries or lorries or cranes or scaffolding or huge lumps of stone. Um, um, and, and all of this seemed very normal because sculptors, above all, are very practical. Um, they have to work out how to get something very heavy, how to get a very heavy piece of stone up some stairs and into a studio. Mm -hmm. So um, endlessly, even the games that we played, even the games that we played on holiday in Broadstairs or at lunch were about weight and size and volume. For instance, you had to guess the center of a piece of paper. Um, you, we played a lot of games where you had your eyes shut and you had to find your way across a piece of paper past various obstacles. So you had to memorize form and distance. And I remember, I think my seventh birthday party, um, my father got out the bathroom scales and he guessed the weight of every single uh, little girl in a party dress who had arrived at the party. So in a way, the, the things that happened in my life were, were always related to his sculpture and were really very weird, but I took it all as very normal. And um, I mean, were, were you allowed into to, to participate with the creation and, and to sort of play with materials? Were you allowed into the studio more than just a spectator? Or, yeah. or yes, I yes. Mean, you were encouraged obviously to play outside of the studio, but but were you part of the of, of the yeah. sort of creation? Yes, I could go into the studio at any time, you know, and I was in and out of the studio all the time. I mean. To a certain extent, I, I, I ran wild. I don't think anybody particularly knew where I was or mm -hmm. maybe even cared where I was, but they did know where I was. But I often went into the studio and I would have a little table with some clay and my father would be modeling. Um, and I would sort of be making, I didn't know, I went through a religious phase. So I was making angels and things like that. And I would say, oh, make me a lion or make me this. And he would stop. And he would make a lion or he would make a dog. Um, and he always had, he had enormous time for play and he loved young people and he loved their curiosity. And um, he, he behaved in a very, he was naturally very charismatic, but I think he was wonderful with people because he had a very natural curiosity in people. He was truly, truly interested in everybody and anybody who, who came to our house um, or garden. But he absolutely, he absolutely doted over you though, it seems that, well, um, well <laughs> with, with this image in particular, I think that, I mean, one thing which I really love about the story of your family is that when you came into his life, he changed what it is that he was sculpting and he started doing these, these scenes, these family scenes and this mother and daughter um, scenes, mother and child scenes, sculptures, um, which, you know, it's, it's it, I think for a child it must be a, a really beautiful um, um, sort of, just, just a really beautiful gesture towards a child. And I mean, do, do you see yourself, yourself reflected in these works? Well, I think, I mean, I think my mother had had um, a couple of miscarriages before me. And my mother um, was in fact kind of the, uh, the moon to my father's son. I mean, they, they were completely matched, but they were very different. And she uh, was Russian and she hadn't really had uh, a family experience at all in her life. She'd been deserted by her own mother. So in a way, mm -hmm. my father, who was the seventh child um, in his family, um, you know, was, uh, was in a way my mother and my father. My mother was my mother, but in a way, my father was both maternal and paternal to me. And I think when I was born, he started doing drawings, you know, of, of me and my mother. And he also started making these family groups. He was also working on the Northampton mother and child. 
uh, he'd always looked in Italian art at um, the Madonna and child sort of forms that you particularly got in Bellini, particularly mm -hmm. Bellini, really, um, because he looked to Renaissance Italian art very much as an inspiration against, um, he loved the tenderness of Italian art, but he also liked the conflict that you got in Aztec or Mayan or, uh, or uh, you know, um, ethnographic art. So he loved the combi, he really liked the combination, um, you know, of both the uh, tough and the tender. So in a way, um, I don't know if I really thought of these works as anything to do with me. Oh, right? really? No. Uh, I mean, I knew when he drew me um, later on, he would draw me with our dog and he would draw family scenes, but I don't know. I don't know if I even thought of them as, at that point, as being something to do with, you know, with my family history or my part within the family. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, um, I think maybe let's listen to your first uh, choice of music um, if we were talking about your um, early life. Um, and um, so the, the first choice that you have um, is Kathleen um, Ferrier. And I think maybe let's listen to it first and then you can tell us why um, you have chosen this particular song. Oh, there we go. So that was your first choice. And I should most probably say that you, you weren't that keen on, on choosing music for, for your talk. We, we've been following this format through all our talks with our descendants, where we've been asking um, the descendants to choose songs which were particularly um, 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 important um, to them for, for whatever reason. But, but you weren't very keen on, on this idea. And, and did you just want to say why? Um, well, I think for some artists, music is tremendously Im important. I mean, I've been following some of the Descendants talks that you've done, and clearly for Miro, um, you know, music played a huge part uh, in his creative process. Uh, I think for my father, music didn't play an enormous part. I think for him, it was literature um, that had played uh, that had had the most influence. And I think as a very young man, he'd, he'd uh, read the whole, whole of Stendhal and Balzac and Zola and D.H. Lawrence, um, you know, and Flaubert and the great novels and, mm -hmm. and Tolstoy. And it was the sort of scope and uh, whole life kind of panorama, I think, and the drama within those novels and the conflict perhaps within those novels, between the tough and the tender. Uh, for him, I think literature meant far more. And for instance, Shakespeare also meant far more. So when you asked about music, um, I searched deep, deep and hard. And I found, I mean, I've chosen this because I do remember him singing this. And oh. I believe during the war, Kathleen Ferrier was an enormous, you know, an enormous, uh, as a as a, I think she was a contralto singer, was enormously inspirational. Uh, did she give uh, concerts at the National Gallery during the war, perhaps? And I was very aware of my father's 
the things that those sort of things that had lived with him. And I remember, I mean, this is from Orpheus and Eurydice, I think. And um, um, I do remember him singing this. And the first, the first World War. I mean, you mentioned it very briefly before that that you know that he had been gassed out. Um, it, it was a very difficult experience for him. Well, in, in I, I think I think for people then. I mean, he didn't. I don't know if it was a. I, you know, I have no idea what kind of experience it was. For him. Mm -hmm. If um, he was, you know, if I had been. I mean, the kind of questions that I would ask him now or would ask him as a 60 year old. And I think everybody probably finds this when they get to the age that their parents were, when their parents were reaching the end of their lives. There were, there are so many questions, so many things that at that point in your life that you've experienced that you actually want to ask them. But when you're young, you kind of flit along and you have no particular interest. But I do remember, I mean, I think for him, the war, I think, he was very young. I, he was a, um, a corporal. He was in charge of a Bofus gun. Um, I remember him telling stories about, you know, running across. I mean, he went into the Battle of Cambrai uh, and I think 700 went in and 200 came out. I mean, he was incredibly lucky. It was incredibly lucky that he was, um, that he was you know, gassed out, as it were. Um, now I would ask him any questions about this, um, but, but at the time. I, when he was alive, and he never. What I did realize, though, what I did realize as I grew up were, uh, was that the shelter drawings, which um, show Londoners sheltering in the underground stations, uh, yeah. sleeping on, sleeping on the platforms, sort of shrouded and covered up, and in each other's arms, very intimate. They're very intimate pictures because they show people asleep and people asleep uh, in sleep are very vulnerable. And there are these extraordinary um, forms of sleeping figures, sheltering and, and holding smaller figures that actually, well, these are like gassed figures. I mean, when people are gassed, they could be dead. In a way, we see his first world war experience in those Second World War shelter drawings. We, I mean, sleep is death. And as you know, in Shakespeare, you know, the death is sleep and, you know, sleep is, a, is it mimics death. And, and I believe that they would not be the wonderful, great deep drawings that they are. They have a sense of being really mon uh, monuments to people who have died or monuments to people. And I think, possibly even what the First World War, that experience of death, made him in a way, I don't mean it in the size way, but I, I mean it in, a mon, in, in, in making a monument towards humanity, towards people who were suffering or enduring. Well, I think that especially with the, with the drawings of the Blitz, of the people in the underground, he really, those really propelled him into the public domain just because he really managed to to capture what it was that people felt that that they that they they saw themselves in these images and they 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 felt that their suffering was being correctly recorded um, in in these images and and this sort of death as you say that was sort of all around them and and you can you really feel them in the images unfortunately we don't have any of the images here but you you can really sort of feel these the the the, the weight of the experience in the images and i think that people responded to to those images um um in, in a way that that sort of placed henry in their yeah. hearts for, but for years to come they, um they so have is a kind of humanity a kind of individuality and a humanity and absolutely. a heroism in the individual. And I know that the sort of family groups now seem, you know, they're family groups, but I think in a way what um, he's giving the same kind of um, dignity and but individuality to, to a human life in a way. Mary, I wanted to ask you, we've spoken about the First World War, the Second World War, of course, you coming along. Um, but, you know, I just wanted to, to ask one question about your, your grandparents. Um, so we had Raymond Spencer Moore, who was a minor, 
Um, and he really decided to um, give a very good education to all his children. Um, he didn't want any of them to work in a mine and, and he really invested in, in, in his children and your grandmother, Mary Baker, um, who seems to have had a very sort of um, central role in, in, in Henry's life. She was a very affectionate woman. Um, what, what do you think the influence was of, of your grandparents on, on Henry, on Henry and, and how do you think that their sort of their background helped shape him or sculpt him, shall we say, into... into I, 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 um, I think, I mean, I never met my grandparents. In fact, in a way, I never met my mother, you know, I did meet my mother's mother, that was extraordinary, but I never really met my grandparents. I met some of my father's elder sisters, but we weren't really, we, we weren't uh, tremendously connected in any way to um, the family units. We seem to be a kind of individual unit, my mother, my father, and myself, sort of in on our own. But I think from my father's point of view, being the seventh child, and in fact, there were eight children, and his youngest sister, who was called Elsie, uh, died um, of a heart, some, from some kind of heart disease when she was very young. She was a great swimmer, and I think my father always felt guilty that he'd encouraged her to swim hard mm -hmm. and win things. Uh, but I think for him, you know, the fact this relationship with his mother, who by that time was a mature, a very mature woman who was suffering arthritis, for instance, in her back. And she would say to Henry, oh, e by gum, Henry lad, you know, rub my back. And he would rub liniment into her back. And I think. Um, you know, the, the sort of sense of time, I mean, when you look at his female figures, or when you look at the huge draped reclining figures, they are not nymph-like uh, figures. His women are always, in a way, I, I don't know if we'd say that they are mothers, but they are sort of mature women who are equal in strength and power, in a way, to men. And mm -hmm. I think that um, he had a huge feminine side. Yeah. I think let's just play one of your, your next choice um, before we move a little bit to um, Italy. Oh, um, yes. I'm just going to um, get the next song up. Um, and this is um, a piece um, from Mozart um, that you chose for us. Um, and here it is. Beautiful piece of music over there from um, Mozart. Um, and I feel like I'm revealing a little bit of a, um, a secret, but you've, you've just yourself come back from Italy um, again. Um, and um, so I feel like um, Italy is, is plays a sort of big, um, yeah. big uh, role in your life. Is, is that a place that you discovered with, with Henry? So Yes, so, so I've chosen this piece of music because, um, yes, Italy was on my mind. And this, that piece of music is from Don Giovanni. And um, my father, um, well, maybe I should roll back. Um, we used to go on, I mean, you started uh, the conversation with me saying, did I realize that my father was famous and so forth. Uh, I think that really only in the 60s, um, you know, when I was in my teens, um, you know, uh, did I start to realize he was famous. Before that, we'd gone on holiday to Broadstairs, okay? And stayed in a boarding house in Broadstairs, the Kingsmead mm -hmm. Hotel. Um, 
and um, where we all shared one room, my mother, my father and myself, and he would collect pebbles from the beach or we would, after two weeks, because he couldn't bear going on holiday, really. He wanted to work all the time. So we were in Broadstairs and uh, it was in the 50s. I, I, I think it could have been 59. I'm, I'm not sure of the date. And um, my father had a dealer, uh, at, um, his, uh, at his art dealer was called Kurt Valentin and Kurt Valentin lived in New York and Kurt Valentin was staying with Marino Marini um, in a place called Forty de Mami, which is near the Carrara Mountains when he died and my father got a phone call to say that Kurt had died and my father flew out to, uh, P to 40 Day Mommy for the funeral. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was back in the day when, you know, flights were military flights and you were only allowed to take 300 pounds abroad with you and very different travel plans. So because he went there, um, he realized, and he had this, um, Commission coming up for the UNESCO piece, and I think you showed that a little earlier. Yeah, I'll just show in you our, the UNESCO pictures. This is him working on it, and that's the right, here we go. the UNESCO piece in Paris. Um, and previously, he'd carved everything at home. He'd carved. Um, I think at the beginning we had the time light screen, which is was a huge uh, stone screen, which is in Bond Street now, and that was carved at, at the front of our house and. Uh, he carved outside sort of under an awning, very much in, in the way that they carve in Italy. Anyway, he realized that the piece that he was going to make for UNESCO was a huge amount of stone, far bigger than he could ever bring in in a lorry to Much Adam. So, uh, and he realized that there was a marble works there called Enro, which had been started by um, a Napoleon soldier who'd gone there. And above him uh, uh, in the Carrara Mountains, or just above Forty de Marmi, is the Michelangelo Cave, where they have pure white marble, which is some of the marble that one of, that his hero, my father's hero, Michelangelo, had, had got. So, so it all made sense and it added up and we started to take holidays there. And this is him in the marble, there was a picture in the marble yard at Enro. So we started to take holidays in Italy, which was wonderful because it meant that um, he could, you know, I've said he hated holidays. He couldn't bear not working. So it meant that one could take um, in the end, we were taking, um, he bought a tiny house there um, and he could go for three months. Uh, it was a very, very basic house with kind of iron bedsteads and marble floors. It had no comforts whatsoever, but we would go there for three months. And um, it meant that he could go and carve every day and then come to the beach. My mother could sit on the beach and then we'd have lunch. So this became a huge feature in our lives and it also meant that we could visit museums uh, here we are i think we might be in the etruscan museum, etruscan museum yeah yes okay. and so we were able to go to florence or we went to pisa and we were able to look at his favorite sculpture you know sculptures by uh giovanni pisano and tino di camaino and we could go to florence and we could look at bellini and we could look at michelangelo and here we are up in the in the um uh, mountains. I uh, no, we're in Volterra here. This must have yeah. been the yeah. sort of trip to um, to the Etruscan to see the Etruscan works because he loved Etruscan things, and Volterra was close by. And these are the marble quarries in um, Carrara. So, uh, which were monumental and extraordinary. And in those days, they didn't blast the marble out with you know, but they cut it with wires, um, like cutting cheese day long evening long and it was very primitive up there and you would drive up into the mountain so it was it was a wonderful place to go did did he have a favorite material was there sort of one material that it was his sort of ideal material to work uh, with he he found that he had to work with something else because of the limitations of scale or 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 weight well i think i mean he was a consummate stone carver when you look at the way that he carved stone he he carved outside, he carved stone outside, and he did that from, you know, early days through the early days with my mother, where my mother, I think, had to help him sort of carry stone and roll stones in. Um, 
but I mean, you can see he was a consummate carver and he was part of this movement um, where they used native English stones. So he was, uh, he used many native English stones like, you know, Haunton stone, green and brown Haunton stone and uh, perfect marbles and, and it, it from English quarries. Um, mm -hmm. You could say that, uh, and he loved the kind of friction and the, and the um, drama, I think for him, the physicality of carving stone. Wood, he said, was, was very different to carving stone. Yes. Uh, carved a lot of wood. And then in the sort of, uh, really it was um, when in the 50s, 40s where he was doing, and 40s where he was doing much more modeling. And he started to model and have maquette studios. And, and as he got older, I mean, he still carved when he was old. He did carve in, you know, when we went in the 70s. I'm just going to bring up these images of him in the maquette studios because we have this yes. wonderful studio of him and you can see uh, this is from 68. Well, yes, so this was his, uh, so he has at Hoglands we have seven studios and the studios were all for different purposes, but he had um, maquette, first he had a maquette studio near the house and this is the maquette, I think this was the maquette studio near the house, or this could be down in, but he would move, he moved it down to the bottom part of the garden, but in the maquette studio in a way it was, I mean, it had all his little models. This is the, um, had all his little models on shelves. It had all the pebbles that we got from the beach at, at um, Broadstairs. It had uh, flints that he picked up. It had uh, wood pieces, it had shells. And in a way, um, this was his, it was like going into a library or uh, a notebook. And he also had a drawing studio. So he would have a little sculpture studio and a drawing studio. And um, I mean, was he ever sort of particularly tempted by, by painting? Is, is, did, did, is that sort of something that he ever sort of so, with picking up on a more serious? Uh, well, drawing, drawing for, I mean, okay, so he's a sculptor, and if you look, and, and he's real, um, I think what was extraordinary about my father um, was, in a way, he was always holding something. So, in a way, he was a human scanner, because he, uh, would, he had taught himself, I mean, by experience and through doing this every single day, and thinking about it every single day and the story that I told you about the weight and the center of the piece of paper and just form and everything. He internalized form both by holding it in his hand, but also by sort of uh, with it through his eyes and his brain kind of mm -hmm. scanning it. And um, he also accompanied his, I mean, he drew all the time. He did what, 7,000 drawings? And his drawings were always, or not always, but mostly intentionally three-dimensional. And I mean, I, I was quite good at drawing. And he just couldn't resist coming along and improving my drawings by kind of making the feet stand on the ground. I mean, making them more solid or the legs rounder or the back rounder, you know. So, I mean, his drawing, drawing is about thinking and understanding form. And I think the two practices, both the drawing and the sculpture went together. I wanted to turn our conversation a little bit um, to the work of the foundation. Um, your father was very, um, as you mentioned, he was he was uh, very keen on education. He would um, he imparted on on you a lot of knowledge um, on on uh, on sculpture, on how to appreciate sculpture and uh, literature as well, of course. Um, do you find that the foundation is the best way to keep? that aspect of your father's work alive? Um, I mean, as he got older, uh, I became, or as, you know, I, as I got older, I became tremendously aware as his only child um, that um, what we had at Much Haddon, which were these seven studios and the grounds, and the grounds were as much, the fields, you know, we have 70 acres of fields were a sort of outdoor, they're outdoor galleries. He was, he was the first person to really show sculpture a lot in the open air. It was all about daylight and daylight is the most modern and, and the best form of lighting you can have. Um, so um, the, 
I became more and more worried that, you know, when he died, this would all uh, be split up. And I think originally he decided to give the garden to the Tate. So uh, the, my parents put in a hedge between the house and the part that he was giving to the Tate. And my mother kept saying, well, move that hedge a bit further, Henry. Away <laughs> so we, we kept <laughs> But I grew up, I mean, I think I grew up in a very altruistic way, feeling that actually we were the servants of art. Art was our religion, his work. I guess we, you know, we were there just to serve and that, that really um, I felt tremendously responsible for it. So I think we developed this idea of an artist's foundation as the best way to keep it together. What he really wanted was the studios to be able to demonstrate his working process because he'd been so impressed by going to Rodin's studio uh -huh. where you pull the drawers out in Rodin's studio and you see all these tiny little arms and heads and bodies and Rodin kind of used to do photo he photoshopped his uh, sculpture he would stick arms and heads and legs together which my father also did and um the purpose, you know, there were many purposes by making, in making the foundation, mostly uh, it was um, to help, it was for his sculpture, but the, the appreciation of sculpture altogether, sculpture, you know, in particular, because sculpture is still um, not understood and not appreciated entirely. You know, we, we have great English sculptors now. I mean, I think probably in England, um, we have many more, uh, ex you know, appreciated and, and uh, sculptors who are enjoyed, you know. Um, um, but I think it was it was about his work and about sculpture. So, um, and the foundation, we gave up everything. I mean, we gave up our land, our houses, the works. We gave away really 90% of what we had to make it the foundation. When, when you first came together and decided that a foundation is what it was that you wanted to, to, that was your aim. What at the time did you find was missing? Missing? As, as by way of, of what was in place legally and what was available to you that, <sighs> that you, you needed to put together to, to sort of the framework. Was there well, anything in place that, that you could- No, no there was no, there was no model. We had to kind of, it was like inventing the model. Mm -hmm. um, and we used different lawyers and different accountants to, to kind of, to put together a model, you know, but be always behind the model was the idea of what he wanted to do. And the idea of what he wanted to do was uh, drove in a way, the legal, um, you know, the, the kind of legal requirements, but we made, probably we made mistakes you know, now there are many different kinds of foundations and living artists make, you know, people make their, I mean, at that point, uh, you know, he became employed by the foundation and all the work he did was then, um, you know, sold uh, to put, to, to build up the cash holdings of the foundation, um, he, um, which was actually very hard on him it was very hard on him it was extremely hard on my mother it was extremely hard on me it was a very difficult thing to do to a living artist who had always been independent and suddenly yeah, you had these rules it was very very tough on us mm. so you you gave 90 percent of your your holdings your land um sort of in a way the the your your father gave up his independence but the foundation's still going and and the work that you're doing is, is still very strong and and uh, people can come and visit which i would encourage yeah. all our listeners to to do and, uh, and i think one the of the biggest the most generous foundations you know in the this Goodness. side of the atlantic you know i mean i think it has a very good track record both in its grants you know and in the way that it supported exhibitions and sculpture and you know I mean I think I think you know it, um, it's it, it's it's uh, enormous it's helped I think it helped the whole of British art while Thatcher was there and kind of causing problems with um, museums and things like that I mean I think it stepped in when where the government stepped out and tell me if if you had 
to choose, and um, I'm sorry if I'm putting you on the spot, but if you had to choose one sort of sculpture or one space where if someone really wanted to understand Henry Moore, <sighs> look at his sculpture, is that is that too awful of a question to ask you? I, I, I mean, I mean, he was, they, they made a lot of, uh, okay, I think, I think he made a lot of films, you know, with, with the BBC in which he explains his work and he talks about sculpture and form. And I mean, he's a consummate kind of, uh, he, he's consummate in the way that he explains and, and, and enthuses people and helps them really grasp um, sculpture and form. But I mean, I think going to the foundation um, would be a really great thing to do. The house is open. I mean, it's not the way it was when we lived there, but everything that we had in it uh, downstairs is pretty much there. And so in a way our house, even the drawing room that my father entertained, um, uh, collectors, friends, poets, musicians, actors, uh, students, anybody who came, it, the big sitting room was a didactic room, and for, in that room, he uh, there was a, um, a sculpture, a, a stone sculpture of a lynx, um, and um, you know he would talk about the, the work in that room in a way to help people open their eyes to form. And this lynx, which is, uh, it's got very pointy ears, yeah. but a very slack stomach. You know the way that when cats have kittens, their stomachs become very slack. Yeah. Uh, so, and the stone somehow completely portrays this very slack kind of stomached moving cat with this very sharp face. And the things in this room, if you're able to look at them, you start to understand the pleasure, the, the constant visual pleasure that um, sculpture and painting um, can give you. So yeah, I would say go there. Okay, I'm going to play your last um, music choice. Um, what I'm going to remind our audiences quickly though is that um, you can ask questions and um, we've got a few questions. So just um, in the Q&A box, um, um, do, do put um, any questions that you have. So we'll play the song um, and uh, Mary, then you can tell us about the song and um, we'll um, move to um, your um, uh, text and um, the questions. Okay. So very different um, pace um, yeah. to your other choices. Um, why did you choose the well, Beatles when I'm 64? Again, okay, um, again, Italy. Uh, I uh, Sergeant Pepper's uh, Lonely Hearts Club Band uh, LP had come out. We, I took it to Italy with me. And uh, this house we had in 40 Day Mommy, uh, I was able to play it outside. We used to play it. This was my father's favorite, uh, favorite track. Um, I mean, he had this incredible, you know, long, loving, extraordinary relationship with my mother, where in a way she she was very silent. She was very kind of um, you know, watchful and silent. She's always standing behind him. Um, always when you see these parties and he's either talking to Sophia Loren or he's got Sophia Loren's hand, my mother is sitting behind. Him. <laughs> so, you know, I know, you know, I know how she felt, but um, so, so I had that because it reminded me of, of, of uh, that summer and also summers in Italy, but also there was this incredible exhibition in Florence in the Fort Belvedere, which was a kind of one-off experimental exhibition in it, that it was the first a big single artist uh, exhibition in a uh, city, you know, which, uh, after that, they've repeated that format many, many times. Um, but at that point, they didn't even know that they would get enough visitors. You know, it was a huge chance to take. And my father invested the most enormous amount of his own personal energy by citing 
the pieces about Florence and um, uh, it was a it was a gift in a way it was a tribute to how much he how much Italy particularly Florence and his experience of um, the Uffizi and the great art he'd enjoyed in Italy it was a tribute to really his love of Italy you know so that's why I've got that. Now, um, for each one of our descendants, we have asked um, for them to choose a um, text. It could be a book or a poem, which was particularly pertinent to, um, to the, um, the artist that we're discussing. Um, and uh, Mary, you have chosen for us an extract from, from King Lear. Ah, well, I mean, I'd partly chosen this because it chimed in with a, with a childhood experience that I had, um, you know, but also sort of ties into my, you know, my father loved Shakespeare as well. Um, I, I think in 59, um, I must have been 13, I'd just seen The Hunchback of Notre Dame, um, the film with Charles Lawton, an extraordinary film, uh, yeah. really incredible and extraordinary film and I've been deeply deeply kind of moved by it and my father knew Charles Lawton and Charles Lawton was in England to play Lear at Stratford-on-Avon I think it was in that July of 59 he actually had cancer but anyway I remember meeting him I remember meeting him at, at our home and then my parents took me to see him in Lear and um, it was just the most extraordinary performance. And Leah, for me, kind of meant everything. And at the end of the play, I mean, you'll remember that um, it's an absolutely grueling, horrific play. Yeah. And uh, in it, Leah is stripped down in a way to nothing. He's stripped, you know, from being a king with a kingdom and three daughters, an army, and throughout the play, he loses everything that he had. And so finally he's stripped down to just barely nothing. Mm -hmm. And um, he, uh, the piece I, uh, is, you know, he finally meets up with Cordelia on the White Cliffs of Dover, but it means so much to me and, and in a way a memory of my father because he went to see Charles Lawton at the end of the play and he was so ill and so tired from the performance. He was lying on a, bed cot in his dressing room still wearing uh, this crown of flowers and a robe and just lying and on the bed and the room smelt of oil paint uh, oil you know is it um the 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 makeup they put on has a very oh, pretty, and and it was just the most extraordinary it was like seeing Leah dead on a bed it was just extraordinary um and had I not had my, you know, I would, I mean, many of the experiences I've had, I would not have had, had I not been fortunate enough to have had the most extraordinary man as a father, um, who was dear, you know, who I miss uh, dearly. Anyway, so I chose a bit from Leah, which is a bit heavy. Um, right, so um, I'm move on now just to the questions um, from the audience. So um, the first question that we have is, um, as he worked on his projects, this is from an anonymous um, uh, um, uh, uh, participant. So as he worked on his projects, was Henry Moore explaining his works and its motives to his daughter? No, no, because um, he said, you should never talk too much about the work you're doing. I mean, I, and, uh, no, he never, explained it to me and maybe I understood it from you know sort of seeing it every day and he probably talked about it with my mother or uh talked about what he was doing but um no he 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 left the work there to speak for the viewer uh the participant to mm -hmm. take from the work that which they wished to take but did he did he ever sort of I don't know if he if he received a commission, for example, within a UNESCO. Did did he sort of ever explain sort of where he didn't really do commissions? I mean, he usually chose something he was doing in the in the studio, and mm -hmm. and then kind of that's what he gave them. Mm -hmm. But I mean, the whole I, I mean, what he really 
made you do, what sculpture is about and why I fear that sculpture has kind of gone back to where it was, you know, in Victorian times was. The whole point about sculpture is that uh, it's a solid thing that stands in the middle of a space or is, is within space. And you don't just view it from the front, you have to walk around it. Yeah. And in walking around the sculpture, you see, you enjoy, you experience surprising and very different views. So you, the whole, something that looks flat, or I don't have a picture, I think of a knife edge piece, but for instance, if we look at my hand, mm -hmm. it's flat. Mm -hmm. But if I turn it like that, it's narrow. So mm -hmm. the whole point of his knife edge pieces are in a way you see something like that, and then you see something that's that. So I think in a way, the whole point of sculpture is that it has to be moved away from the wall so that it's freestanding, standing yeah. in open space, and you relate to the object and you move around the object and you are exactly. surprised by your physical response as well as, as well as your visual response to this change in form. Mm -hmm. um, we have another question of um, um, that, uh, also from Anonymous, um, it seems to have a really lovely um, upbringing. Were there any downfalls of being a Moor? There were, okay, I mean, I was pretty good at drawing and painting and stuff like that, but by the time I was 12, so that was be 46, 56, kind of late 50s, mm -hmm. when he's really starting to get, uh, um, people are coming to our house, you know, I realized that he's exceptional. I did, I do understand what makes uh, an exceptional artist or somebody exceptional, uh, somebody who invents a language which hasn't existed before. And at, that point my father was probably nearing 60 and sculptors more than painters possibly even painters are very aware of mortality and they've got a lot of sort of they're very they're often quite testosterone driven because actually heaving huge lumps of stone about it, it requires you to be like that so they're they they're very aware of mortality and they start to measure themselves against, against the great artists of the past yeah. So we had this dreadful game, um, which was, um, you know, your top 10 artists. And we had, he had his top 10 and the family knew who are his top 10. Everybody who came into the house was asked for their top 10. And mm -hmm. woe betide you if they weren't, it wasn't as serious and heavyweight as our top 10. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, you kind of, um, but in a way I started judging myself, not only against his achievement, mm -hmm. But against the achievement of people like, you know, Giotto and Shimabui and um, Michelangelo. And, there were, and I thought that there is no point me being an artist unless I'm an A, you know, an A artist. And I knew that I couldn't be an A artist because I knew that they are born in a way. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a combination of they are born and they make themselves, but also the times around them also mold them. And I knew what made uh, an exceptional artist who had their own language. So I didn't um, make any art or do, a, I did a bit of uh, illustration, a bit of this, a bit of that, but I didn't really do that. And I wish I had because probably that would have shut me up and stopped me talking a lot, made me a much happier person. <laughs> Oh well, that's that's a very that's a very sort of melancholy thought to to, to leave um, our talk on. Um, Mary, our time is up with you. Um, thank you so very much for for um, this really insightful, very very interesting um, conversation. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I hope that our um, our audience this evening has enjoyed it as well. Um, uh, so thank you very much to you. Thank you very much again to the Henry Moore Foundation for their extraordinary work that they're doing, but also with their help um, with our images uh, uh, for this evening. Um, and uh, for everyone, um, we really look forward to welcome you down in Petworth to Newlands House Gallery uh, to see um, this exhibition and our future exhibitions as well. Um, and um, yes, well, thank you very much, everyone. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Maya. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have a good evening.